Okay, uh, Republic versus Democracy. Okay, thank you. Client. Now it's misused a lot in, in business English, but in legal English, client means you have an attorney and he's advising you. Go ahead. No, a customer, you have a business relationship of some kind. That's okay. If you don't want to use it, that's fine. You're sovereign. If you want to prohibit the use of that word in your court, that's fine. You, you lay down the law. Okay. So anyway, um, just a couple of little things to get out of the way. Um, <clears throat> the question was, a judge decided, decreed that rights and privileges are the same. Do you know how that affects us? Well, if you let him be in charge, it affects you any way he wishes it to. On the other hand, if you're in charge, uh, you say that's frivolous. <laughs> that's what they do, right, when they're in charge. It's frivolous. You know? Hey, uh, well, in fact, that brings out another point. Capitalization of the name. Okay? Anybody heard that one? Okay. Now, I'm not saying that that's an invalid concept. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen the Texas law that says that if you don't, something to the effect that if you don't say you're not a corporation, the presumption is that you are, or words to that effect. I don't have it down accurately. But see, when it's my court, it's my discretion too, isn't it? I'll, I'll lay down the rules. Hey, if you don't want the word customer used in your court, that's fine. Okay, let's... Um, uh, so anyway, caps versus lowercase, that's, that's my position is, is that if I'm doing the judging, then it doesn't make a hill of beans difference to me, not in my kingdom or my court. All right, let's go on to the, the let's see, republic versus, versus democracy. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but I do want to get some basic things explained about it. Okay, basically, let me explain a republic by first explaining a democracy. Okay, in a democracy, we've all been taught 51 beats 49, right? So, that means that the majority wins and the minority loses. Okay, well that's perfectly clear to me. That means the minority has no rights. They can't exist in a democracy. So all these clowns running around here demanding democracy, they should be careful what they wish for. Because democracy means the majority wins and whatever privileges the majority grants to the minority it's purely at the will and pleasure of the majority. Okay, that's a pure democracy. In a democracy, if we look here in the uh, dictionary, I got this out of uh, the Black's Law Dictionary. It says, um, here we go, democracy. It's that form of government in which the sovereign power resides in and is exercised by the whole body of free citizens, directly or indirectly through a system of representation, as distinguished from others. Okay, got that? The whole body. In other words, you have this big argument, big difference of opinion, you vote on it. Whatever the group says in the voting process, that's the law. And everybody now is subject to the law, even the ones that voted for it, okay? So the sovereignty only exists in the entire body of the citizens, but not in the individual citizens. So 51 beats 49, the sovereignty is in the body, whatever the issues are, they vote on it, now everybody's subject to it, you have no choice. No rights for the minority at all. And the majority doesn't need rights because things are all going their way anyway. Okay? Contrast that with the Republican form of government. Republican form of government is one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people. Remember, that can be singular as well as plural. And are exercised by the people either directly or through representatives chosen by the people. 
Okay? Now, my position is I own the government. I'm really not against the vehicle code. What I am against is, is, is the abuse of power. And I, I think it's a very reasonable rule that everybody should drive on the right side instead of the left side, that everybody should stop at the stop sign. That's pretty reasonable to me. Um, it's also reasonable to me that you don't stop at a stop sign if you can see clearly in all directions. Nobody's there for, you know, so go on through. But as a general rule of thumb, I'll stop at a stop sign, partially because of the threat of the uh, citizen cops, you know, partly because I think it's reasonable anyway. Um, but I own it, so therefore I hired these guys to work out some rules. You know, maybe I wasn't personally there, but the people hired them. And so they came up with a system of rules and they said, this is how we're gonna run things. And that's great. Um, but the thing is, is that notice this. It says a Republican government is one in which the powers of sovereignty are vested in the people and exercised by the people either, and here's the key, directly or through representatives. So, I hire the representatives, they create a system of courts, okay? And these courts conduct the cases, right? Because I created this system, I'm one of the people, I've created it and it's a good system, I like it. Sometimes. But you know, in my sovereign capacity as I look over this system that, that I own, Sometimes some issues are simply too important to leave to judges, okay? Some things are too important, like individual rights. So what I do in order to do that is I exercise my power directly instead of through my representatives. I open up my own court, okay? That's what a republic is. In a republic, the minority is important. What does sovereignty mean? It means no higher authority. The sovereign decrees the law. Now, when I go to court, um, I'm not subject to others. Why does it take a jury in America, in a criminal jury, why is it that it takes 100% of the jurors to get a conviction? Well, very simple. You take a jury consisting of 12 people, theoretically, now this is all theory, but it's how we did things, okay? We have basically have said that each juror represents one twelfth of society. Now there's many ways to compose a juror. The, uh, in Athens, um, in Greece, a jury consisted of a thousand people, the theory being that there wasn't anybody rich enough to bribe a thousand jurors. Okay, that's why they had such large jurors that juries then, and that's how Socrates got convicted in one of those juries. But in America, we have decided, for whatever reason, that 12 is the magic number instead of a thousand. And we've said it has to be all 12. Why? Because if you have 11 people saying guilty and you have one saying not guilty, what you're really saying is that one twelfth of society agrees with you as, rep as in accordance with their representative. That one juror is a representative of one twelfth of society. And so if you, if you can convict on 11 to 1, what you're saying is, is that one twelfth of society has an opinion that doesn't make, is not important. That's one twelfth, that's eight and a half percent or eight and a third percent, something like that. Okay? Yeah, it's eight and a third percent. So you're saying eight and a third percent have no, they're not significant. If you can convict on ten to two, which is what some states I think actually do now, we're saying that, what? Uh, 16 and two-thirds percent of society doesn't count. Well, now, now you have a democracy. See? Okay, so in a republic, in your sovereignty 
is absolutely unassailable except under one condition. And that condition is that if you get 100% of society against you, you're done for. Okay? But as long as you can get one juror representing that segment of society in a republic, you're covered. That's for criminal type stuff. Okay? Now, that's just a, a quick trip on that because we have something far more important to get into. And that is a court of record. Okay. We have, I'm going to skip the California Admission to Union. We have a court. Let me explain what a court is. There's this article about a court. You should read and read it. It's very important that you understand what a court is. I'm just going to, I'm going to distill this article into one short sentence. A court is a stage upon which the sovereign conducts his show to convince the rest of the world that he's right. That's what a court really is. You can give me all the court rules and everything like that, but the number one question you should keep in mind as you're conducting your court proceedings is, what will other people think? See, that's the ultimate criteria. It's not a legal criteria, but it's a practical criteria. So make sure that, that when you conduct your proceedings, when you look at these papers, did you notice when I flashed the example on there how much it looked like an ordinary court paper? I mean, it had the headings on it, everything in place, there was no capitals, there was no screaming on paper. Did you notice that? It was all very, just like an attorney had written it. That's good, because you want them to think an attorney wrote it. You want to make that impression. But there are certain key things in there that make the difference between my papers and an ordinary set of papers from an attorney, and that is, number one, I'm a people, and number two, I'm in a court of record, which I'm going to explain the court of record. Okay, but right now I'm not talking about a court of record. I'm talking about the generic court. A court is a place where you put on a show. You're the sovereign, you want to put on a good show. All right, you're the king, you're sitting on your throne, and you see some knave outside through the window stealing oranges off your orange tree. Okay, what some kings would do is they just send the guards out, grab and throw them into the dungeon, no problem, that's it. All right, well, the problem is, is that on visiting day, the, uh, the uh, prisoner's brother visits him, and the prisoner tells him, you know, I, I, I was treated unfair, I didn't really do it, and uh, does a, tells a convincing story to his brother, and his brother says, you know, don't worry, he says, I'll take care of you, bro. I'm the chief cook. I can deal with this problem. And the next day you have a dead king. Okay? So, we come up with a court procedure. Replay this example. The king's sitting on his throne, he looks out the window, he sees some knave stealing oranges off his orange tree. Sends the guard out, brings him in, and they put them in temporary custody and they say, okay, everybody, uh, make the announcement, we're gonna have a trial. This guy, the, the king thinks he did something wrong. We're gonna have this trial, everybody's invited, all the courtiers come in. Now back in those days, they didn't know how to read or write, unless you were a priest. And, uh, and so the, uh, uh, the members of the court were the memory of the court. They've been replaced by eight and a half, by 11 sheets of paper, but the, the sheets of paper we file today are the replacement for the courtiers that were in the king's court. So the form is different, but in substance, that's the memory of the court, see? So you have the trial, everybody attends the trial, the brother of the uh, prisoner is there too, he looks it over, he sees all the evidence presented, you know, and the cogitation that goes on, and the king's just kind of rubbing his head, you know, he, and um, uh, anyway, come to de decision, he's guilty, and then we have a little book here for certain types of crimes, we, you have to serve so much time, and he goes back into the dungeon, just like before. Now visiting day comes, and he tells a good story to his brother about how unfairly he was treated, but his brother says, you know, bro, he says, you went looking for trouble and you found it. I was at the trial, I saw the evidence. So the king lives to another day, doesn't he? That's why you have a court. You're putting on the show. 
I mean, the bad guy knows he was bad. The good guy knows he was good. You know what the answer should be. So that's why you have the court, is because, and you're in your sovereign capacity, you could order him to be thrown in, but you want to put on a good show because you don't want to have hidden resistance. I know people who have judgments that can't get them enforced, okay? <coughs> because they put on a bad show and the sheriff refuses to enforce them. The, you give the sheriff an order of execution on a judgment, default maybe, or something, whatever. And so the, the sheriff is against you, so the sheriff calls ahead to the guy he's supposed to arrest or grab his car or whatever. He says, hey, he says, I'm coming over in a half hour. Are you going to be there? The guy says, yeah. So the sheriff goes there. The guy's not there. So he goes, well, I couldn't find him. Ever had that happen? You ever hear that happening on judgments? It does. Okay, so you want to put on a good show. You want to convince everybody that, hmm, you got a real case here. So don't, don't get wild in your papers. Just do, make it look normal, but don't give up your rights. Okay, retain your sovereignty and stay in a court of record. All right, now that's what I'm going to talk about next. You're going to love a court of record. All right, I told you there's five requirements. There's four and a half, actually, because the fifth requirement is optional. The fifth requirement is, is that the court has to have a seal. It doesn't have to have a seal, but it generally has a seal. Okay? You know what a seal is. You crimp the paper with it or stamp and it says seal. Okay, that's an optional requirement. Now, if you look in Black's Law Dictionary, fifth edition, it tells you right there the two requirements of a court of record. Number one, it has the power to fine or jail for contempt. And number two, it keeps a record of the proceedings. Okay? And I love this because I love that fifth edition and later. I like these attorneys who are always up on the latest, you know? They got the latest materials and so forth. Because I say, I'm one of the people, and in this court of record, complain of whatever. All right? Now, so if an attorney should happen to be sharp enough to detect that, which they aren't, I haven't met one yet that I found out was, but if he happened to be sharp enough, he'd do the right thing. He'd go to his dictionary, he'd look it up, and there it would be. Court of record, power to find a contempt, and keeps the regular proceedings. No problem, slam it shut, move forward. What's the rest of the complaint say? All right? Well, you're going to about to find out what he missed. Here's a court of record, the five requirements. I told you about number five, generally has a seal. I told you about number one, keeps a record of the proceeding. And I told you about number four, power to find or imprison for contempt. But look at number three, proceeding according to the common law. No statutes. Got that? No. no statutes. Look at Article 6, Section 1 of the California Constitution. It says right there, I'm summarizing it, but it is very short anyway. It says, all the courts in California are courts of record. So why are they using statutes? I'll tell you why they're using statutes. Because you agreed to it. That's why. How did you agree to it? Very simple. You failed to object. That's all. They brought it in. You didn't object. You didn't demand a court of record. You just let it slow, flow right by. No, no criminal court in California is a court of record. Why? They use penal code. That's not common law. You see, it takes more than a name to make a court of record a court of record. You've got to act like a court of record. You know, just adopting a name doesn't do it. So when you see statutes being enforced, when somebody cites penal code section so and vehicle code section so, health and welfare code section so and so, you know you're not in a court of record, okay? So the, it, it's, has, it is proceeding according to the common law. The California Constitution recognizes the common law as the highest law. 
if you allow statutes to come in, you will be subjected to Civil Code Section 22.2, or is it Code of Civil Procedure 22.2? I forget which one. It's the one that says that the, ca that the common law shall be the rule of decision so long as it's not repugnant to the codes, right? You know that one? I think that you'll find that in the Code of Civil Procedure or, or the uh, Civil Code and you'll also, I believe, find it in the penal code. Okay? Well, how is that possible? If the Constitution of California says that the common law, uh, uh, it says that the, uh, uh, it says that the courts are courts of record, which you now know uh, proceed according to the common law. And by the way, lower down, the actual case sites are there, so don't worry about it. The, uh, it, it it's, a, it's a court of record then how are they getting away with this? Well, what they do, well, let me explain a lawsuit. In a lawsuit, you sue somebody, civil suit. Actually, a common law suit is not a civil suit because a civil suit is a suit based on civil law. Okay, so it's actually common law. But anyway, you get the civil cover sheet and you fill it out as if it were a civil suit. It doesn't make, affect the case at all to fill out those civil cover sheets. But anyhow, you've got this common, um, you make a, 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 this lawsuit going. Now I forgot my point I was going to make. Sorry. It'll come back to me in a moment. You're suing me. Yeah, but I had a point to make. Yeah. It'll come back. Anyway, let's go on to point number two. This is the killer point. This is the one everybody's going to get up and cheer, I hope. In a court of record, the tribunal is independent of the magistrate. Now, let me explain what a tribunal is. A tribunal is the one who does the judging. Now, what's a magistrate? Well, if you look in the penal code, it tells you all judges of all the courts are magistrates. That means they can't do any judging. They're not tribunals. The tribunal has to be independent of the magistrate. California Constitution says all the courts are courts of record. Court of record, the tribunal's independent of the magistrate. You see that judge doing a decision up there, you know you're not in a court of record. So there's two points against it. Number one, the judge is making decisions. Number two, he's using statutory law or codes or admiralty law or anything else you want, but not common law. Okay, so hold their feet to the fire. I want a common law court. Okay, make your charges. This brings it back to basics. But actually, I don't wait that long. Before, if, 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 there's, if there were a criminal charge pending against me, I'd do what's called a counterclaim. A counterclaim is different from a countersuit. In a countersuit, you kind of balance things. You say, well, okay, A is suing B and B is suing A. The judge sits there in the middle and he just kind of totals it up and, you know, comes up with a difference. And whoever got that difference, that's the winner. And he awards that. That's a countersuit. A counterclaim, first of all, your counterclaim is based on jurisdiction. You're challenging jurisdiction. And it is a, it is, there's, you won't have any trouble finding case law on this. It is solid, absolutely solid case law that when the issue of jurisdiction is raised, the court must prove its jurisdiction before it can proceed. You're familiar with that, right? Okay. Must prove its jurisdiction. It cannot assume the jurisdiction. It cannot, <laughs> you're going to love this. One judge, I said, oh, what's your jurisdiction? And he said, my jurisdiction, my rope's my jurisdiction. <laughs> That's proof. <laughs> well, I had to admit the facts were correct. He did have a world, you know. But you see, jurisdiction must be proven. And if he does anything, if, if he does not prove it, what is he doing? He's committing a fraud upon the court, isn't he? Because the judge is not the court. You ask any attorney, what's the difference between a court and a judge? And say, well, they're really about the same. Not really any difference. The heck there isn't. What is a court? The definition of a court. Here's the, here's the legal definition of a court. And it's in here, by the way. 
it is the person and the suit of the sovereign. That's a court. Okay? The plaintiff owns the court. It is the person and the suit of the sovereign. That's the first sentence you will find in Black's Law Dictionary. Well, maybe not the first. I think it's after tennis courts. Okay? The person and suit of the sovereign. The sovereign combined with his suit, those two elements make an artificial entity which is called the court. Okay? The judge is the highest officer of the court, but he is not the court. Nobody's the court. You're not the court. The sovereign's not the court. It's the sovereign combined with his suit that makes the court. Okay? When I create a court order, and you'll see samples of court orders in that example. There's actually a couple of them there. I always put in the upper left-hand corner, Atronatus Privatus, which is Latin for private attorney. You look up private attorney in the, in the dictionary, a private attorney is somebody who's an attorney for one special purpose only. You can be a private attorney, you cannot be a general attorney who is holding your services out to the public. You can't do that, but you can be a private attorney. And who are you representing? You're representing the court. The court is an artificial entity and cannot speak for itself because it has no vocal cords. Somebody has to represent this artificial entity. So you have an entity. Normally, the representative is the judge. Normally, in your customary procedures, the judge is the witness to the court's decision and he speaks for the court because the court cannot speak for itself. That's the theory. So, when I issue a court order, I appoint myself as a private attorney, and then when I, when I sign the paper, the first line after everything is the court, because that's who's issuing the order. The court, not a human being. And then below that, I sign it with my name, and below that I put private attorney or in Latin, atronatus privatus. This is strategy, it depends on how much I want to browbeat them, okay? Whether I use Latin or English. But the idea is that you're an attorney representing the court, okay? So you're a private attorney in the court, you, you issue that order, and now you're, you know, you go from there. Whenever, by the way, as a footnote, whenever I issue an order, I always make it an order to show cause as well, in addition to the order. So if I order something, I also say, or show cause why this court order is not proper, or why it shouldn't be executed, or whatever. Then, I'll tell you, of all the orders that I've been involved in, not once have they ever shown cause. Never filed a paper. Never said a word. Okay? Well, they did say a word. I have to admit that in the transcripts we got it in here. The court said, well, we have a difference of opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so you see, a court of record is very, very well defined. First of all, you start off with a court. It's the person in the suit of the sovereign. But then, that's just a court in general. Now we get down to specifics, a court of record. Well, I mean, yeah, a court of record. Keeps a record of the proceedings. Tribunals independent of the magistrate. Proceeding according to the common law. Power to find a prison for contempt and generally has a seal. Okay? You see, you see why it is I'm able to uh, bounce out a, a judge's order? Now you cannot do that if you're a defendant. You can only do that if you're a plaintiff. So take... Take notice, if there's anybody here that's asleep, wake up, okay? Somebody asleep back there? Make sure she knows, if you're a defendant, you cannot issue any orders, not at all. Do not issue any orders if you're a defendant. Before issuing any orders, convert yourself into a plaintiff, then issue the order. How do you do that? With a counterclaim. 
Okay? In other words, you're suing in your counterclaim. What are you doing? You're suing because they exceeded their jurisdiction. You're challenging the jurisdiction. They are obligated to explain themselves. They have to prove their jurisdiction. And who do they have to prove it to? They have to prove it to your court. Okay? They have to satisfy you. Now, don't be frivolous. Remember, what's the number one purpose of a court? It's to put on the show, isn't it? So don't be frivolous about throwing your weight around with your newfound powers. Okay? Every order I issue is explained. Judges issue orders, but they don't explain them. They will explain them if you demand that they explain them before they issue the order. Remember that. Before they issue the order, you tell them you want the order explained. If you wait until after they issue it, they don't have to explain it. That's in the court rules. It's also in my court rules because I adopt the rules for my court. And that's a safe thing to do because after all, who exercises discretion? Me. Okay? I think the rules are great. You read those rules. Actually, you go ahead and read those rules. You'll see that they're actually pretty reasonable. It's the abuse of discretion that's screwing things up. And so I, I'm very comfortable with the rules, especially if I'm the final authority. There is no appeal from my orders. If there were an appeal, then I wouldn't be a sovereign, would I? I do not yield my sovereignty to the agencies which serve me. Okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of theory here, but you gotta be facile with this. You gotta, you gotta have this. You know how I jump from thing to thing and as it relates, I pull it up out of my memory. You can do that too. Let me tell you how to do it. Okay, there's a technique. It's not an easy technique, but there is a technique. What you have to do, if you want to learn this, if you want to try it out, you absolutely must teach it to someone else. The doctors, when they go through their medical education, they have a three-step process when they learn medicine. It's called see one, do one, teach one. Okay? They see a medical procedure done, in other words, somebody teaches them. Then they do it, they get the practice, and then they teach the next doctor. And it's when you teach it is when you really learn it. That's when I learned this stuff. Um, when I was first learning it, I was struggling, just like everybody else. In fact, I'm still struggling, but that's another story. But, you know, when this, this, um, I happen, you know, you may have noticed that I use the name the Nitty Gritty Law School. Well, there was a gentleman that started the Nitty Gritty Law School. His last name escapes me at the moment, Bob something or other. But he was selling some videotapes where he was covering a lot of these subjects. And um, when he had a heart attack and died, eventually, a couple months later, his wife called me she was getting these questions from people who had bought the tapes and she couldn't answer the questions. So he asked, she asked me, could I answer them for them? And uh, I said, well, yeah, I'd be happy to, but I need a resource where I can go when I get stuck. And so uh, she made the arrangements. There were some people, in fact, several people, and that I could call and discuss it with them and come up with answers. So over a period of about, I don't know, uh, 10 years, something like that, I got involved with about 150 different cases. So we got a lot of, I got a lot of uh, vicarious good experience. We made our mistakes. Some people went to jail. Other people didn't. But it, I learned this stuff because people asked me the questions and I was teaching it. And there's something that happens to your mind that forces you to dredge up the answers. You must absolutely work with each other. If you're going to take this disc home and study it and try to run your case from it, well, you can do some stuff, but believe me, the quality is going to be way down there. So work together in groups. Make sure you got a case, jump in and help. 
because the number one beneficiary when you jump in and help is going to be you. you you'll be amazed at you'll be surprised you know what I do sometimes you, you're not going to believe this but there are videotapes of me giving you know lectures from time to time once in a while I'll pull out one of those tapes and watch them I really learn a lot from those tapes <laughs> I didn't know I knew that <laughs> you forget stuff too you know so really I can't emphasize enough you must work together your group memory somebody will remember something you forgot okay the other thing is is that if you do use the tapes play them over and over again you'd be surprised what you hear the second time through and the third time through and the fourth time through it's just amazing what you get so do that replay the tapes unfortunately this tape is really limited I've really skimmed over I've mainly entertained you rather than giving you really good stuff okay kind of open your eyes but uh, you really got to study that CD to get the benefit you don't really need me if you really work together and work with that CD so I'm just telling you it's nice to talk it's fun but don't have to do that now that was the court of record okay that's all there is to a court of record but it's a very important concept okay court etiquette very important you never talk to the opposition you always talk to the judge okay even if you're talking to the opposition you aim it at the judge okay that's an unwritten rule of court etiquette when the other side is presenting his story don't shake your head don't groan don't show just be like a statue he gets his moment in court lying through his teeth that's what they do sometimes maybe all the time if they're cops I don't know but you know you got you just you'll have your say okay now um, so and there's more stuff in this article let me explain quickly what habeas corpus is back in the days of England I'm not giving you a legal definition I'm giving you the real definition of what a court is back in the days of England um, the king had many courts he had the common law court the equity court the court of the exchequer the star chamber court admiralty court maritime courts tax court okay you probably heard of some of these courts all right now the courts are just like bureaucracies that's all they like to build their empires right so naturally the consequence of that is that sometimes an equity court would take a common law case or the admiralty court would take an equity case so what they did they set up a system where let's say that admiralty was cutting into equity and you're the you're the defendant what you were entitled to do is you could run over either directly or through your representative if you're in jail run over to the equity court and say hey these guys have invaded your territory and that procedure for letting the second court know about it was called habeas corpus so the second court became the dominant court okay the second court would take the case and look at it and say hmm yeah that looks like equity that's ours or they'd say no that is admiralty that's not our territory and throw it back so that was the concept of equity it was a means of turf protection and so but you know how bureaucrats are bureaucrats if they get the opportunity love to stick it to their fellow bureaucrats if it means enlarging their territories right I mean that's their characteristic and so habeas corpus became a means for sticking it to the other guy if you were not a common enemy in other words the second court liked you then they'd take the case they'd say oh you guys you don't know anything about equity you know your area is admiralty this should have been over here and then just for good measure they'd cut them loose and say well that case didn't even belong in here right showing up the other guys 
that's if you weren't a common enemy. Now, if you were an enemy to both, if they neither, nobody liked you, well, that didn't work. Okay? But habeas corpus is the only known right in the history of law to have grown stronger with time. All others, the government slowly encroaches, but that one grew stronger. Why? Because it had nothing to do with rights. It had to do with turf protection on the part of bureaucrats. Okay? So, that's what habeas corpus really is. I think it's habeas, habeas corpus as subjiciendum, something like that. Okay? That's the full name. But habeas corpus is turf protection. Now, how does that apply in America? Because what they did, the two most common battling courts were law and equity. So, in the United States, they combined them. Now the same judge is both a law judge and an equity judge. He was both a judge and a chancellor because that's the proper title for an equity judge. He's a chancellor. So whether he's a judge, meaning a law judge, or he's a chancellor, meaning an equity judge, uh, made no difference at this point, it's the same guy. As a result, 99.9% .9 of all habeas corpus uh, applications fail, okay? But here's how it works with us. Once you go into common law, remember, the common law is still good here in the United States, okay? Why? Because it's recognized by the Constitution, about three, four different places in the U.S. Constitution. When it uses the word law in the Constitution, they mean common law, okay? So, there is an ancient rule of law that says that the king, the sovereign, is always subject to his own court. That's why you have a court of claims. You see, the, the, the king declares the law and he says, okay, he decrees it. This is what the law is. But the king cannot break the law because if he does something contrary to his own law, all that means is he changed the law. So how are you going to enforce the law against the king? You can't. So what you do, they acknowledged in England, and we inherited it in the United States, that Sometimes a king has a moral obligation, maybe not a legal obligation, but he has a moral obligation. If, if an action by the king caused harm, even though he's not legally liable, he's morally liable. So they set up the court of claims, and that's the purpose of the court of claims. You go to the court of claims, you say, hey, king, come on, you know, pay for what you did. Okay, new tape, time out to flip. Line two, you mean? Yeah. yeah, paragraph two of that lawsuit? Yes. Yeah, sure. Sure, we go to the example. Okay. Yeah. All right, we rolling again? Okay, so the question is, uh, how do you activate the, the court of record? Well, you do it in your, your action. Okay, so we'll go down here to the action. Uh, first amended action. Okay, and here it is, paragraph two. Can you see it on the screen? William, William Jones is one of the people of California and in this court of record, complains. That's it. It's now, that's it. That's activated. You are the plaintiff, and as the plaintiff, you have a right to choose your forum. I choose the forum specified in the California Constitution. All courts are courts of record. And remember, I own those courts as one of the people. Right? right. See, if I own the government and the government owns the citizens, and I'm not a citizen, I'm one of the people, and I do not yield my, sa my sovereignty to the agencies which serve me, so I go into that court. That court's a court of record, and what's the definition of a court? It's the person and suit of the sovereign. Okay? That's in there somewhere, so you'll find it. But, so combine that all together. I'm the person and suit of the sovereign. And 
I said it's a court of record, yes. You did an earlier sheet that just said, this is a court of record all along. Oh, that. Okay, sure, we'll go back to that. Gotcha. The definitions. No, it's all along. This is a court of record. Right on that. Yep, here we go. I think I know what you're talking about. Right here, court of record. There it is. This thing? It's the case. The case that came before the last one you showed. So this is a court of record. You lost me. I talk a lot, but I forget what I say. Just before the last one you showed? Then just before that? Yeah, well, I, my memory is erased. I have a destructive readout on my memory. So. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry I can't fulfill that request. However, it's on the film. So, uh, but what is the question relating to court of record? What is it that you really were digging for? Not that. It's the way you presented it to the court. The uh, way you presented it to the magistrate. Right up there, number two is what he presented. Well, well, in the the presentation to the magistrate is your original filing. That's. That's what I showed you. That was the amended action. Yeah. First amended, uh, the first amended action, which normally would be your action, but if you're doing a counterclaim, you would say a counterclaim, but you, right there, that first paragraph, it is, you say you're one of the people, and this is a court of record. That's it, does it. You decreed the law because you're one of the people, and you're, you're, you're sovereign, so you can decree that sovereignty. Okay? So, um, Going back to this other here, um, the habeas corpus. So in the habeas corpus, you see, you as a sovereign are subject to your own court. And there have been cases, like there was this one king, um, he was presented with a problem. The chief judge said to him, if somebody who was of uh, one of the nobility, and he didn't want to name any names, but he said if somebody were doing this and he was cheating on his, his uh, noble woman in these conditions, what would be the penalty? And the king said, well, with that, it would have to be death. Well, it turned out he was talking about the king, and so the court executed him. Be careful who you appoint in your court, okay? So, I make it clear that this is a court of record. That means no authority for the judge to make any decisions. He's a magistrate. He cannot make any decisions unless I permit him, unless I certify it. He wants something, he looks to me, I say, sure. Okay, looks to the attorney, he says, sure. But I've already explained the difference, okay? So, <clears throat> habeas corpus, that's what that is. Now. Common law. <clears throat> what is the common law? You've all heard that it's custom and usage, right? But where do you point? How do you put some muscle behind that? Right? You say you want to run your court according to the common law. What is that common law? Now, you know how bureaucrats are. They like things in writing. They can't handle concepts for some reason. If you don't show it into writing, it doesn't mean beans to them. Well, I'm going to show you where the beans are. Okay. Confirmatio Cartarum. Magna Carta, basically the noblemen got tired of the king conducting his wars and forcing them into service and taking their wealth, you know, to, to pay for the wars. So one day they cornered King John on the River Thames and they presented this little document called the Magna Carta and they said, sign it or we'll cut your head off. And so he signed it. Now, when he signed it, he had absolutely no intent of uh, keeping his word, but they kind of had the upper hand. You remember, this is in the days when each nobleman had his own army, you know, his own military. <clears throat> the king would borrow the military from the nobleman to conduct his wars. And also, the pope was kind of in charge there, too. And the pope uh, said, uh, later blessed it and said, yeah, the Magna Carta is good. But the Pope really didn't intend to uh, keep the word either. 
and they were just going to wait for a more opportune time when they built their political strength and they'd straighten this situation out. Well, you know, I guess God works in mysterious ways. Well, fine, he authored I didn't. I just said they presented it. <clears throat> okay. Well, fine, if that's, if that's it. He says that the, the Pope authored the Magna Carta, right? We thanked him. It's right in it. Read it. Fine. But the point is, that we, I accept that for value, okay? <laughs> okay. Now, but the point that I'm getting at is this. Within a year... One of the two died, the king or the pope. And I think it was like about two, three months later, the other one died. This created a power vacuum in both spheres. The king, the new king was King Edward. And the new pope, I can't remember who he was. But it created this vac power vacuum. You know, whenever you get a new leader in, he's got to establish his power base. He had enough power base to get to that position, but that doesn't mean he's going to be a success. I mean, we've had a lot of kings that only served one year, you know. And, um, but you had, uh, you had this other power base called the noblemen, and they were still organized. And they didn't lose any time. First thing they did is they got King Edward to bless the Magna Carta, to reaffirm it. And they also got the new pope to reaffirm it. And they had to because they didn't have the strength at that time. And then in succeeding kings... It was the Magna Carta was reaffirmed again. Is that correct? You know your history, right? Okay. So there you are. It was it was uh, um, it was reestablished. Now, check this out. Confirmatio Cartarum. This was the second king, King Edward the first, and who followed uh, King John. He signed the Confirmatio Cartarum. And here's the important point right here, starting with number three. Okay? It says, in, he, it says Edward, by the grace of God, King of England, and so forth, he's, he's delivering his message. This is a writing by the king. And he says, And that our justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other ministers, which under us have the laws of our land to guide, shall allow the said charters pleaded before them in judgment in all their points. That is to wit, the great charter as the common law. Okay? So, if you are a defendant, you can demand that the Magna Carta be the common law. They can't force it on you. The common law is the common law, but if you demand that the Magna Carta be the common law, then the king's men, in other words, the judges and all those guys, sheriffs, whatever, they must accept that as the common law in writing. Okay? And this is an important thing. I got this out of a, a, a bar association book. <laughs> okay? That's where I found it. And you look at the Constitution of the United States and you look at the Constitution of California, they all support the common law. Well, what is a common law? This is what the common law is. The Confirmatio Cartarum, in other words, the confirming charter, says specifically that if you choose, then the Magna Carta is the common law. Now, there's a couple of neat things in the Magna Carta. Okay? Let me go down to the interpretation. It kind of distills it. Okay? Confirmatio Catarum says the Magna Carta must be accepted as the common law by government. The Magna Carta is the supreme law. All other contrary law and judgments are void. And voluntary taxes cannot be made permanent. Where have you heard about that before? Okay. Now, I just, I just picked out some highlights. There's more in those papers. But the issues that we're always dealing with, well, this is, this is where, here's kind of like a quickie summary. Here I quote the Magna Carta, and then I give a brief, plain English explanation. So, Article 20 of the Magna Carta basically says, The fine shall be proportional to the offense, and shall only be imposed upon the testimony of non-government men. 
Okay? Okay? A, a villain, in the same way, if he fall under our mercy, shall be immersed, meaning fined, saving his wainage, and none of the aforesaid fines shall be imposed save upon oath of upright men from the neighborhood. Upright men are not government. Okay? Earls and barons shall not be immersed save through their peers, and only according to the measure of the offense. Similar thing, okay? Now, look at this one. No sheriff, constable, coroners, or other bailiffs of ours shall hold the pleas of our crown. Plain English, no sheriff, no bailiff qualifies as a witness. He cannot subject you to his law. It doesn't qualify. He cannot... You remember they say all of the... Uh, they have the proceedings, the people of California versus so-and-so, right? Or the people of the United States versus so-and-so. Well, who's signing that? Who signs that information? One of the district... Either a district attorney, somebody. Well, that's prohibited under common law. If this is a court of record and it's going according to the common law, he's out. That's what that means to me. Okay? No constable or other bailiff of ours shall take the corn or other chattels of anyone except he straightaway give money for them and can be allowed in, in a respite in that regard by the will of the seller. In other words, he can't confiscate your property. The rule of eminent do domain also applies to personal property, which must be paid for when taken. Okay, that's basically what it's saying. Now, 30 is one you're going to like. No sheriff, nor bailiff of ours, nor anyone else shall take the horses or carts of any freeman for transport unless by the will of that freeman. That's right. <laughs> All right, you're familiar with that modern problem, aren't you? That was 800 years ago. A vehicle. That's sovereign. Freeman is the sovereign in America. Mm -hmm. So, can't take your car without permission. However, if your car has a license plate, it's owned by the state, isn't it? You're familiar with that. So, okay. All right. Let's see. Here's a. Uh, now, 30, 34 is your protection. Henceforth, the writ, which is called precipice, shall not be served on anyone for any holding so as to cause a free man to lose his court. Okay? If you're sovereign, you do what sovereigns do. What do sovereigns do? Well, one of the things they do is they have their own courts. Somebody violates your sovereign's law. Now, what qualifies? Basically, it boils down to this. Is there an injured party? No injury, no obligation. Okay. Well, did you did you demand a court of record? Did you make a counterclaim? No, 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 no. Did you make a counterclaim? No. You did a counter suit, or a suit, or an original suit, but you didn't make a counterclaim. Okay. It's very important to make a counterclaim. You want to stop that process until your lawsuit's settled. Of course, now, remember, I'm giving you theory. There's also practical. And so in practicality, they're going to move forward. Now, I haven't brushed up on this, um, what do you call it, the uh, Council on Judicial Performance in California. But there is a Council on Judi Judicial Performance, and there's also a similar thing federally. Now, I can tell you how it used to be. And then there was something voted on by the citizens, and then they changed the rules somewhat. But here's what it used to be, and I know that there's got to be traces of this left. But it used to be that in section 900 and something or 9,000 something of the rules of court, they had a procedure for complaining against a judge. And it used to be that you would send, if you sent a letter to them, the committee would receive it, the council would re receive it, they look at it, based on what you tell them in the letter, they decide whether or not they'll check this further, okay? So, if you had to be for something, that was the word you got. Well, let the council and judicial performance know. Write them a letter. 
But if you read further into the procedure, it says that if you give them an affidavit, they must investigate. They have no choice. Okay? Hardly anyone ever sent in an affidavit. They always sent a complaining letter. Okay? Now, they can't change your case, but they can make it hot for the judge. Okay? And I would say check out that procedure they, because there's still remnants. There's some, yes? You're not supposed to be asking questions. Right, a microphone. Well, oh, microphone. You're supposed to be asking questions. You're supposed to be teaching. Yeah. Questions come after you're finished. Oh, well, we've, I've, I think I've gone past your normal closing time, probably. We're talking about closing. We're listening. All right. <laughs> okay, well, if you can keep up with me, great. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, anyway, on the, uh, it's, look, I've given you a lot of theory tonight. But don't forget practicality. I mean, there are people who will ignore you, okay? If push comes to shove and, and you know, they have the guns, you don't. Yep. But we don't give up. Look, just getting back on an everyday le level, you know that robbery is illegal. So we created a law outlawing it. Did that stop robbery? No. no. But did we give up trying to enforce it? No. We still try to invoke it when we can. So I, I say the same thing here, but I also, as I said earlier, I believe there's enough honest people in there. You give them the right paperwork, you'll get hidden support. There was a woman one time, in this one case, she went all over the LA court in downtown Los Angeles looking for her case. It was missing from the clerk's records. Nobody knew where it was. She spent the entire day hunting for that case, and near the end of the, the day, she found it. It was on the judge's desk. She didn't go in there, but somebody went and looked. They found it. And that was illegal on the part of the judge, because that was supposed to be in the custody of the uh, clerk. At the end of the day, she was out. She was walking down through the aisle, and the employees were coming out, they were all in the aisles, and there was this little clutch of women that were talking, they were clerks, and they were talking among themselves. And as she walked along, one of the women separated from that group and went over and said, are you Mrs. So-and-so? And she said, yes, I am. She says, I just want you to know how much we appreciate what you are doing. And then she went back. You see, that clerk couldn't openly help her. But behind the scenes, there is support. Okay? In another case, uh, I, I suggest you be very friendly toward these people. You never know who your friends will be. Now, this is practicality, not law. Okay? Huh? They're human. They're human, yes. Yes. They, they may not understand it. You know, they operate in ignorance, too. They got their routines to follow. They think they're right. But here's what happened. This actually happened. This woman, I had told her, always be friendly with everybody. So anyway, she went down to the court, and she was always friendly with the clerks, always told jokes, traded personal stories, you know, how are the kids kind of thing. And over time, she developed a rapport with the clerk. One day, she went in the clerk, and the clerk, she had an order. I don't know, if against the judge or something. The clerk said, I can't file that. Well, why not? Well, she says, I, just, I can't, it's not proper. So she was ready. She said, well, here's a court order ordering you to file it. Okay, she was prepared. The clerk said, well, that's not a proper court order. She says, you know, if, if you're, and they were friendly, okay. There was no animosity whatsoever between these two. They were just talking and trying to mutually solve a problem. And she argued for four hours with that clerk, going back and forth, saying she had the authority, and the clerk saying no, and the clerk told her, look, if you want me to actually do something, your only recourse is to go up to the appellate court and get a court order from them telling me to do it, and then I'll file it. So she was kind of at a dead, you know, kind of dead in the water at that point. So she went home at noon, called me on the phone, and we discussed it, okay? And I said, well, we're going to have to think our way through this one, what to do. So that, was, that happened on a Friday. Saturday morning, 
she went back in the days when they had Saturday delivery at residences, you know, she received a letter from the clerk. The clerk invited her to bring the papers down and she would file them. And she pointed out that section 13... 68 or 26, 1326 I think it is, of the United States Code, Title 28, the Civil, Civil Code, okay? Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. It was that particular code that said that the, uh, that the, the district court, the United States District Court had original jurisdiction where over a clerk or any federal employee to order that employee to perform a duty owed to the plaintiff. Well, what happened to the defendant? The statute specifically addresses the plaintiff. Well, what happened is this. The plaintiff owns the court. The clerks are the plaintiff's employees. Okay? A court is defined as the person in suit of the sovereign. The defendant is an outsider. If the defendant has a beef with the employee of the court, he's got to go up a level higher to get the order to order the lower court to do the job. But when you're the plaintiff, you own it and you have direct. Well, we never dreamed that section was there. We knew we were right in principle. And it was the clerk that found it for us. Okay? Boy, was that a real gold mine. So, never underestimate the power of your adversary to be your friend. Okay? Be nice to these people. There was a... Uh, uh, in Thailand, I believe it was. You remember... Some of you people remember these Buddhist monks that were dousing themselves in kerosene and setting themselves on fire? Had quite an impact on the government and international rules. So what happened, you see in Thailand, it was real simple how they solved problems. If you were a problem to the government, you disappeared at midnight, no problem, okay? Well, here's this, these, these Buddhist monks were causing all kinds of trouble internationally, and everybody knew who was responsible for these Buddhists doing this. It was their leader. He was encouraging his people to do it, and everybody knew it. And this guy went around the country with a minimum protection, and nobody touched him, nobody heard him. And it was the wonder of the reporters of that area, the newspaper reporters, you know, and TV and so forth. Why didn't this guy disappear at midnight? That's what happened to everybody else that was that troublesome. Well, the reason was very simple. Everybody liked him. <laughs> The guy was just simply so likable, even his enemies loved him. Oh, he was a pain in the neck, but they didn't want to hurt their buddy. <laughs> you know, he was a, he was a nice guy. <laughs> and that's how he survived. So, be sure when you're not conducting court business, you know the minute you turn your back, your adversary would love to stab you. Okay, you know that. They'll pull every trick. I've had an attorney call down and take the, claiming to be me, and take, the, uh, uh, take my motion off calendar. And then I show up and the judge isn't prepared or anything else. Okay? They do all kinds of dirty tricks. They use wrong case numbers. Anytime you get a paper from somebody, check it carefully. That case number might be different. Okay? So, what I've found was that be nice to everybody, your buddy. I had one attorney screaming at me in, in the San Diego, uh, not San Diego, in Orange County Courthouse in Santa Ana. I heard the echoes bouncing off the end of the, the wall at the end of the hallway, okay? He was yelling at me. He was really out of control, and I was nice to him. <laughs> of course, that made it matter. But generally, you're nice to these people. So I just want to tell you that, that always be nice, even to your enemy. You'd be surprised what will get you. Um, Let's see, well that kind of is a big summary of uh, what I would like to say. Um, let's see, uh, is there any quickie here? Yeah, I guess, oh, well, 
notice and demand or uh, notice and uh, request. I'm changing my uh, view on that. It says notice and demand there, but I think it should be a notice and request because what are you doing? You're trying to get a contract with somebody. Somebody, a demand means that by right, somebody owes you something, by your right, and you have a right to demand it. But that's not too polite. If you say notice and request, remember titles do not affect the body. In the body, you still say what you want, and that's what counts. So you do that. Um, okay, hit me with some questions. Sure. First of all, I am a jailbird. Oh boy. I like jailbirds. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I've been arrested and thrown out public meetings over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that when I've always believed that truth plus law, plus common sense, equals justice for all. I don't care if you come from the moon, I don't care if you come from anywhere mm -hmm. in whatever galaxy. But what's your question? But the thing of it is, mm -hmm. we have a pedophile judge in San Bernardino County. Do you have the facts? Yes. Then, then sue him. Uh, no, uh, he, he is still in office. And he's been laundering quite a bit of property for the powers that be. So well, sure. a lot of people have written to the Judicial Commission. Mm -hmm. He says, how could this be? Sure. The Judicial Commission actually sent me a letter stating that, yes, he erased his own evidence. Mm -hmm. And that he, because he wasn't brought to a higher court mm -hmm. and condemned, even though he had uh, molested other children in Ontario, sure. that... Uh, He's still the judge. Well, get those, you get those people to file a suit. Look, it isn't what you do, it's what people complain about that counts. You know, if you're just going to uh, talk about it without any muscle behind it, well, nothing's going to happen. You got to get the victim to make the, the you know, file the... Is now 24, has had his bro, uh, job. Well, then he's a big boy now. He, he has been raped in jail. From sure. the time he was 14, the, sure. the judge has used him. Sure, okay, that happens. So what you have to do is you've got to get him to file a lawsuit. Now, if he's in jail and he can't handle it for himself, then what you can do with your sovereign capacity is you can go for habeas corpus. You can file a habeas corpus in the name of another. That's in the procedure. What they've done is put a gag order on the family and any time that he speaks of it, they put him back in jail. Sure. And this is yeah, but that, that gag order does not apply to lawsuits. The gag order applies to the family as well as to the victim. Then that what they have to do is appeal that order or file an original lawsuit, which means they'd have to learn common law and so forth. Look, the, the law does not protect he who slumbers on his rights. And it doesn't count. It doesn't count. There's no buts. Many of the judges are family related. Yes. And they do have incestuous relationships. Yes. In the courts. Yes, but who's complaining? And I mean complaining, legally complaining. It doesn't, you can't just talk about it. You've got to actually put some muscle behind it. Or take it to a grand jury and have the grand jury make a presentment. They have their people in the grand jury. I'm sure they do. Yeah, if you've ever watched the procedures. Which, by the way, let me mention something about grand juries. You know, look, if you, if, there's a difference between morality and law, okay? And obviously there's power there that's being abused. Obviously there's power being used to protect the judges themselves from their own criminal acts. So you have to go outside that system. Maybe it calls for a federal type thing, and sometimes they're in bed with each other too. So, you know, I, I'm not saying it's a perfect system. Sometimes you have to just say, well, I can't fix that problem, move on to one you can fix. You know, you, can't, you cannot change the ship of state. What you can do is affect it by degrees. See, a, you, a big ship does not suddenly turn. It goes half a degree at a time, slowly, and ends up in a new direction. That's what we're doing here. 
You know, if a robber has you in the alley, he's got a gun on your, in your ribs, and he says, give me your money, you give it to him. And, and you're, he's wrong. You don't stand there and say, it's against the law, his mother won't approve, and so on. You've got to, but what you do is once you let go, once he lets you go, then you move heaven and earth to gr try and get even. But if you can't find the power to do that, sometimes you just have bad luck. The, as Kennedy said, life is unfair. Yes, sir? Wouldn't it be possible that uh, one way to operate would be to file a civil RICO on federal lawsuit? <clears throat> well, you have to be the injured party if you're going to well, file you're a civil. The, you're talking about the injured party. Department. Yeah, sure. Sure. So but you can also, if he's in jail because of something, you could now bring it up habeas corpus in his behalf. That it, you see, you cannot sue in the name of another except in habeas corpus. Habeas corpus you can. Well, speaking of uh, habeas corpus, uh, I understand that with the uh, USA Patriot Act, that, that that now is in limbo. Well, that, that may be true of the civil law system, but the common law has not been suspended by the Patriot Act. Okay. Okay. Have because you, you're outside the Constitution. So have you ever challenged any of the uh, U.S. Patriot Act uh, no. activities? No. No. It's involved? too new. I haven't been involved. I haven't seen any cases on it. Well, I saw that was on the front page of the paper here just last week, I believe it was, in yeah. the last 10 days, that uh, some judge finally said that this clause is unconstitutional. Oh, great. Great. Somebody challenged it. One me. Right. So, uh, how about, uh, you mentioned about uh, license plates, and if you have a license plate, of course, you're, sure. uh, you don't own your car. Yeah, you have a federal tax stamp, and, and, right. and a, the very meaning of the license means that the owner's granting permission to, use, to you to use his property. So, is that the way you operate, or do you operate? Yeah, I have, I have a, a car with license plate and so forth. Just as a practical consideration, I'm involved in a lot of things, and I haven't taken the time to properly deal with that issue. So I took the easy way out. I went ahead and got it and so forth. And how about your driver's license? Same deal, but it's without prejudice. Both of them are without prejudice. If I ever get a ticket, I think I can deal with it. All right. If I choose to. I might choose to pay it because it's small potatoes compared to some real big issues I'm involved in with other people's cases. Right. Well, See. speaking of the UCC and uh, yeah. you know, operating outside of the uh, driver's license, I have just written on here in manual, just cursive, I'm a traveler slash sojourner, not a driver in UCC 1-207, which of course you're familiar with. Uh, two days ago, I was stopped uh, by a cop in a parking lot, uh, mm -hmm. a shopping center over by USC. Sure. And uh, he he wanted to see my driver's license. Sure. So I showed this to him, and I said, you know, I've, I've operated this way now for the last 12 years in, in four states. I've never gotten a ticket for this. Mm -hmm. I want to put him on notice. In fact, if he was going to challenge that and give me a ticket, he was, you know, to be yeah. have some repercussions from it. And he, they checked it out, they called in about it, and they let me go. Well, apparently you're on the records as being somebody to leave alone. Well, yes. Which is good. Right. And, I, of course, I've gone to court before. Yeah. You know, so what's your question? So my question is, uh, have you dealt with people who have operated this way here? Uh, have you ever helped them? Deal with, uh, this Not with these issues. I've stayed away from driver's license issues because they, there, I had bigger things to deal with, right. people in jail, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. But okay. yeah, Thanks. but you know, here's what I would do: if you really want to do it right, look, I suggest that as a policy, okay, just as a general way to do things, I don't think you should fight a traffic ticket. I think what you should do, if you get a traffic ticket, go down and pay it their bail, you know, but pay it and be sure to sign it without prejudice. Now that gets them off your back. Now if this really is an issue with you, then sue them because, but now you're the attacker. Okay? You signed without prejudice, you gave up nothing, you have all rights to sue them, and they have no justification to get out and go after you because they got the money, the thing that they were after. So now you sue them. But what you could do before you even get a traffic ticket, you could get a driver's license so that you know you avoid the hassle on the street. But then, let's say you really that is important to you and you want to follow through. What I would do is I would shoot for a declaratory judgment. 
but I would do it on my terms. In other words, I'd create a, a lawsuit, this lawsuit, in my sovereign capacity, I'm suing the state. Well, background first. I'd write the state and say to the state, what would you do to me if I didn't get a driver's license and you caught me on the street traveling? Okay? They will write back and say, we're going to do you some harm. We'll put you in jail or whatever. Now you have a justiciable issue. Now you go to court. There's a disagreement. You haven't done it yet, but there's a disagreement. You say, what would happen? They say they do this. Well, you object to that. So now you go to court and you get a declaratory judgment, and it's your court, because you're the plaintiff, and you're the one who's sitting there. And then once you make that judgment, you now order the state of California to update their records, which say that you are not subject to their jurisdiction. And then when the cop stops you, looks up that driver's license number, and, it says, and they tell him to leave you alone, he will. He'll respect their word. So that's the technique I suggest. It's much better to be the attacker than the defender. Great, thank you. And you don't give up that right. Yes, ma'am. What do you mean by the state? California. Or the Secretary of State? Or no, no, California. The, the DMV. Whoever you're dealing with. The cop, if you want. No, well, if you're asking for, for Come on over to the mic. You want to know, who do I mean by the state, right? Who do you mean by the state that well, he likes to, to ask uh, if, if he's required to have a driver's license? Well, I'd write Department of Motor Vehicles on that one then. Sure. Because that's the one who prosecutes you. Sure. It's the DMV. Yeah, well... Sort of, yeah, it's the district attorney, actually, but, but yeah, that's what I do, DMV. They're the one that issues the Sure, sure. Right. Right. Okay, yes. Uh, Mr. Ford, can you just give out your website one more time? Sure, the website is with or without the www, it doesn't matter, but you put in 1215.org, and that gets you to the website. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, uh, my girlfriend would go to her daughter's, and the daughter either, it's, that's irrelevant, but we got a cell phone so I could talk to her daughter's. That was an AT&T cell phone, and um, but they have been trying to be God's only, and I don't like having a God over me. Okay, um, that happens. Okay, it was supposed to be $46 the first month, which we paid. The second month it was 104. The third month they charged 171. Do you have a contract? Unfortunately, yes. I have never had a. No, 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 no. Do, do you have a Do you have a contract that I specifies? Have a contract. No. D does the contract specify those terms that you just told me? I don't know. I didn't. Well, you got to read the contract. That's all in the contract. Well, if it's not in the contract. Then, I was going to call the FCC on them. Now, well, so look, the contract, the, I'll bet you that, well, I won't bet you, but I'm certain that in that contract it's going to say something to the effect that all verbal agreements are cast out and that, they, that this contract is the sum total of the agreement. Check your contract. You've got to read. I asked him five times. Guy, Don't ask. Read the contract. You'll make your own decision. It's fiduciary when someone tells you verbally. No. Read the contract. They're not authorized to alter the contract. Doesn't matter what they tell you. Read the contract. Don't avoid your job. Read the contract. It's a contract question, a contract problem. You've got to read it, and that controls. If so, uh, you're talking about some judges, other people were talking about some judges. Sure. Are friends with other judges. Are well, that happens, sure. That doesn't happen to me. I have a cousin who's a high pressure lawyer. Well, okay, that's fine. Will okay, and sure. Well, then you. I'm still nice to him. And he still screams at you. Yeah, but. He was that way when well, he was six years old and I was seven. Well, then open up your common law court and go after him. That's really what I want to do. Yeah, be kind of fun. Because he'll be in there not understanding it, and when you overrule him, he can't figure out how or why. Anyway, we. Uh, <laughs> in 98, my aunt died and he did the will. Okay, but the bottom line is... I can't change that. Yes, you can. You can go sue him in court, and it's your court, unless he does a counterclaim, which I d he probably won't do. 
Well, okay, you got to get the emotion out of it. Okay, what can I? Yes, sir. I have a question. Does the plaintiff own the court? Yes. Or criminal cases? No. Well, the, in a in a criminal case, the plaintiff is the state. Sure, they own their court, but when you do the counterclaim, you're opening your court, you're now court against court. And you're the second court, and you're challenging jurisdiction, and they have to prove their jurisdiction to your court. If they prove it, well then you say, okay, continue. But if they don't prove it, then you, over, you order dismissal or something, award damages for bothering you. Can I give you a specific situation? Well, I mean, that, you, you described it, that's the general gist of it. Go ahead, try. I mean, well, I was attacked by a guy twice. He was by what? Before attack me. Yeah. You have about 20 years younger than me. Sure. I used to figure out it was easy thinking. So uh -huh. things didn't quite work out the way he expected them to. Right. So he screamed for his wife to get a gun. Sure. So they came out and arrested him for assault and battery and terrorist threat. They dropped without me being present. They dropped the assault and battery, which means I lost my ability to collect damages, so I complain. Reopen the okay, this is a criminal case against him, right? Right. Okay, your status in a criminal case like that is a witness, that's it. You don't own the court. Not in that, not in that context. Okay. Like that's case. state business. On the other hand, you may have a case against him because of the upset he caused you, injury, if any, bruises, whatever, you know, yeah, sue him. That's insane. That would, and that would be a common law case okay. in a court of record. Then you'd have fun. Thank you. His, he, he'll lose sleep. It'll, if nothing else, it'll cost him money to go hire an attorney because those kind of people generally don't educate themselves in law. Okay. But that's <laughs> in the civil court, right? Sure. Okay. Well, the common law court. Common law court. Yeah. How do I distinguish between that? What I mean? Well, when you open it up, you say, I'm one of the people, and this is a court of record. Or in this court of record, I complain of such and such. Follow the example. Thank you. Okay, perfect. And then, if you ever want to take something to the grand jury, how do you find it? Uh, grand jury. That's a whole separate area of discussion. Okay. Anybody want to hear about grand juries? Yeah. All right. If you want to hear about grand juries, I'll give you some ideas about grand juries. Thank you. Okay. But I'll answer the next question until we got enough people listening about grand juries. Yes, ma'am. You had another question? Uh, I, I wanted to say that sure. the, the impound in my vehicle, uh -huh. the contract, why they took my vehicle was because I did not have a tag on my vehicle. Sure. So I told DMV and Mike Chakla, I directed my mail to him, and I said, my contract with DMV has run out. Uh huh. I do not have a contract with you. I have my ECC one taking me out of the public into the mm -hmm. private sector. I sure. have my UCC three and I have a claim to the title. Okay, but I'm see, for yeah, right, right, right. But you see, the problem is, is that you're just talking to them or writing them or something like that. That's not legal process. I mean, I, I've gone after them. I'm going to, I am in federal court right now. Oh, okay. Okay, and they're trying to say, they're sure. trying to say that statutes and, and uh, codes right. still receive my rights, which is a lot of crap. Yeah, but you, but you see, they've, they've said that. Now what you do is you rule on the motion. If the, if, if the, well, you're, you're, you, you violated one of the rules of good courtmanship. Okay. Yes, really. Because, <clears throat> because the world, think how the world looks at that. Nobody's going to believe that your case is worth $10 million. My rights and my vehicle work because they give me freedom. To you. To you. That's right. But you forgot the most important rule. You still forgot the most important rule. I didn't say you're wrong, I just said you forgot an important rule. Okay, what is the definition of a court? The primary definition is a court is a place where you put on a show to convince the rest of the world that you're right. And I can tell you, well, I'm just telling you what it is, what, what my experience is, if you, you're not passing, 
you're not passing the show test. You may be passing the legal test, but you're not passing the show test. And that's not, I know a guy who has a multi-billion judgment against uh, uh, one of the cities in Orange County, actually Riverside County, city of Corona. And you know what? He's not even close to collecting. They all laugh at him. Okay? You gotta have more to uh, your suit than just a judgment. They stole my vehicle. How easy can it be? $10 million worth? Heck yeah, they took my vehicle. $10 million worth? I had a title to Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm convinced that you're convinced. I have a claim to the title. Great. Okay? I don't Don't care. object to me. It's, I don't care. I'm not the one to inv Judges or whatever. You're not hearing me, are you? Well, they didn't hear me either. That's right. Said, Why is that? I said, sir, this is my job. Don't argue your case before me. I'm not the judge. Okay? I'm just telling you that I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying that you haven't passed the show test. Well, that's very idealistic, but you haven't passed the show test. They stole my vehicle. Do you know what the show test is? Yeah, I have what? Tried what is the show test? What's the, the show test? No, you you haven't passed my test. You haven't pa you, you haven't really got it. You're close, but that's not it. You've got to, you've got to convince the rest of the world that you're right, and you're not doing it. Well, you're right about that, but it's not, you're not right about the $10 million. They had no jurisdiction to do that. That's correct, but it's not worth $10 million in their minds. It worked. I didn't see their Cadillacs working as good as my this. Did you collect the $10 million? Not yet. That's right. I don't think you will. I don't think you will because you're not passing that test. See? If you'd said 10000 you might get it, but not $10 million. Tell me if I passed the test. Pardon? Uh, I, I didn't. I stopped registering my uh, 1991 right. automobile in 1995. Sure. And it was uh, towed away because it was parked in a preferred parking area and it had no plate on it. Sure. Okay, but um, what's the question? I was uh, uh, the, the police when I went to the department of the police department. They right. said I would have to register the car. That's their rules, sure. Sure, back. right. So what I did was I went to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Right. I wrote a check. On the yeah. back of the check, I wrote that my automobile was confiscated and it was in bio, uh, yeah, without due process. Sure. In violation of the Constitution of the United States of, okay. of, of 1787 and the Constitution. Why didn't you sue them instead? Pardon? Why didn't you just sue them? Okay. Well, then you. Anyway, I got my car back. They endorsed the check. Mm hmm And I never got another registration. Okay. Did I do anything right? Well, yeah, it, is, it isn't wrong, but I, there's other things I would have done instead of that. But you know, there's many different ways to handle a problem. I took in the car with no license plate since 1995. Okay. Have you ever been stopped? No, I haven't. Okay, and well. And I don't have a driver's license either. Well, let's see. The acid test is when you get stopped. What's the what's? Why don't you go down to the DMV and get a copy of your record? Maybe there's something on there that says leave you alone. Um, Check it out. I should do that. Yeah. However, the license is still registered in the system. The well, it'll always be there. It'll always be there. But there's no record of anything else. Okay. Well, great. I'm, but what's your question? Or it's just testimony? Okay. All right. Yes, sir. I was wondering if I have a scratch report. I've done a TV show for about 15 years. Yeah, get closer to the microphone. Okay. I did a TV show for about 17 years. And one of the people on my show gave me some advice going for it. Uh -huh. I just wonder if you know this is like an aberration, but I won the easy and it was just too easy. Uh -huh. um, what he told me, uh, I filed about uh, 10 motions against the judge to accuse them of the Sure. Case. And uh, he knew that was trouble, so he closed out the court, he had a car uh -huh. locked the uh, windows, sure. he threw everyone out, he threw my counsel out. Mm -hmm. I was me and him against. Right, back to common law here. Yeah. 
So um, he calls my case. I walked up to the swinging gates. Uh huh. And when I did that, I stopped real abruptly. Oh, short of the right. I did go to the bar. Right. So um, I he asked me to come into the bar, and I said no. I'm here on a special appearance, not a general yeah. appearance, yeah. multi-jurisdiction. Sure. I denied his jurisdiction. I said, I'm here to challenge your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. He told me if I didn't come to the bar and issue a bench warrant, I told him, well, fine, I'm here. Don't bother. Just arrest me now. Mm -hmm. And you think you can. Mm -hmm. He got all upset. Sure. And threw me out of court. You called his bluff. Right. And that was the end of the case. Oh, great. There's more than one way to skin a cat, and he might have figured, wait a minute, I don't want to bother with this. I've met guys like me, you're, you're more headache than it's worth, and nobody was there to witness it. It's just you and him, so who knows what he wrote in the record to justify his action. But he just probably didn't want it, and it wasn't that serious a case. Now, if you'd been in there for murder, it might have been a different result. But, you know, these things happen. I've had cases unexplainably dismissed, too, even before I got involved in this. So I can't explain it. But I've heard that technique before, and apparently it worked in that case. I know of other cases where it didn't work. Now, the reason they didn't work is unknown to me. It may be ignorance of the judge, he just went ahead and did his thing anyway, or it could be that uh, he actually had a point. I don't, well, okay, well maybe, maybe uh, you got a valid technique and that judge knew it. If you had an ignorant judge, it might not have worked. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So is that it? That's your question? Okay. I had, I had the same judge as him okay. a couple of years earlier. Sure. Uh, when I did have a driver's license, yeah. uh, I was stopped because I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. Okay, that happens. There was a fine of $22. Yeah, protecting the state's property, right? Right. Okay. Um, I wrote a letter to the court uh -huh. uh, and sent them a public money office certificate. Yeah, that's a whole nother technique, right. <laughs> I wouldn't use that in the common law, but yeah, you could do but, that. But I used that. Uh, they okay. to accept it. Sure. Uh, it was good upon the declaration of someone right. from the United States within 90 days. Right. And I had my address on it. With okay. Anyway, I went to the court. Well, now, excuse me, but I'm, I want to answer questions. Are you making another testimony? Yeah. Okay. And it's a different area of law. It, it doesn't, the area I'm in is a different strategy. I'm not saying it doesn't work, and I've heard of the public uh, money order, or, uh, I can't even remember what it's called, but, but I've heard of it, but that's not where I'm at. They refused to take the money, they sent it back to me. Okay. When they did that, I sent them a, um, a notice of dishonor. Sure. Is the guy behind you going to get a chance to ask his question? Yeah, because they dishonored my payment. Sure. So, uh, but I went down to the court anyway. I made, a, I made a, right. uh, an appearance in the court, a special appearance. Okay. The same judge is here, Larry, Gary Bynes. All right. Now, you're not letting the guy behind you ask his questions. You're continuing your testimony. And I told that I was there by special appearance. Uh, and sh I showed him the, all the papers that were sent to the court. Now, how can I help you with all this testimony you're giving me? <laughs> You're in a completely different area of law than what I'm talking about. Okay. okay. I mean, it's it can be valid. I'm not saying. He, he dismissed the case and said it was paid. Okay, yes, great. Okay. Yes, sir. This is, I didn't mean to belabor this. I had asked a question and gave him the answer, but I just couldn't write it down about when I get into a civil court. How do I just make sure that I can convert this into my court? Yeah, get closer to the mic. Um, you can adjust it, yeah. It tilts. Sure. Uh, because I have retained an attorney for the civil case, I don't know what to do. Uh -huh. uh, and he doesn't seem to be moving forward with this. How yeah, well, you're, you're in the court's jurisdiction when you retain an attorney. And his first duty is to the court, his second duty is to you. Then I should probably just discharge this guy. Yeah, basically dump him. I mean, if, if but you're on your own then after that. So, you know, it's, it's, do you have the knowledge to handle it? Well, I suggest that if it's a serious case, that uh, you either educate yourself real fast or put yourself on the mercy of your attorney. But don't be in between. Well, I'm not sure that he's going to have to make the rest of him. Well, that's right. You maybe fire him and get another attorney. But apparently it's not working for you the way you want. 
So you, uh, well, then maybe you better educate yourself. Okay. You know, you the first thing to do though is just to counterclaim. Counterclaim. Right. And then the second. It takes a lot. That's basically it. You counterclaim. Okay. That's like another lawsuit, but then they have to answer it. That's what you do with lawsuits. Okay. And then you can reply to his answer. And then he replies to your reply. It's got a different name. I forget what it is. Until at some point you're ready to go finish off the case. But again, that's a whole area. I just gave you highlights here. I haven't given you enough detail to really work at it. Well, this guy is a very aggressive guy. He's shown no reluctance to the panel. Sure. He's indicated he will again. Yeah. And now I'm supposed to give my personal information to his attorney that he can give to this guy. Well, you know, sue the guy. I mean, if, if you you got a battle going, if he's going to be, if, if the guy is totally incorrigible and he's, he's an aggressor, well then rake him through the coals then if that's what he wants. The only problem I have is, is making sure that once this is over, I've severed his ability to connect with him. Well, you can't. I mean, you, you know, you always have to remember, you have, you, well, you have to remember that you cannot outrun a bullet. Okay? That's true. So there's those considerations too. You know, there's reality and there's theory. I know what you can do in theory, but uh, the reality sometimes is a little different. Okay, Let me answer, a, a deal with the grand jury question since I dangled that and somebody showed some interest, unless we should cut off. You want to talk about, okay, I, I'm going to talk about grand juries for a moment. This is, I think you'll find this kind of interesting. Okay. The first thing to understand about a grand jury is that we haven't had one for years. There, is, there are no grand juries anywhere in the United States, as far as I know, that are sponsored by the government. All of the grand juries that exist today are statutory grand juries. Now, I want you to notice something. No grand jury has more than 24 people on it. Typically they have 21 or 23 people, but never more than 24. Okay? Why is that? Well, here's the reason why. When you go to the, Mag the Magna Carta, on the Magna Carta, Article 61, it defines a grand jury. Okay? So we'll go to, let's see, Foundation Magna Carta. <clears throat> if we go down to um, Article 61, it's a, uh, Article 61 is a very long paragraph. Now, you know, you know that Magna Carta is common law, right? You know that. Because of uh, the Constitution of the United States and the state recognizes common law, okay? Since it recognizes common law, you can bring it in. Now, <clears throat> Article 61 says exactly what common law or what the uh, grand jury is. And you read down here, and it says something right here Okay. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. Finding the beginning here. A little hard to find the beginning sometimes. Okay, basically the king, what the king is saying is that if the king himself or any of his minions bug you, a grand jury can take care of the problem. And here, here's starting at the top. It says, Inasmuch for the sake of God and for the bettering of our realm and for the more ready healing of the discord which has arisen between us and our barons, we have made all these aforesaid con concessions. Okay, the king is conceding this, this stuff. Okay. It says, Wishing them to enjoy forever entire and firm stability, we make and grant to them the following security that the barons, namely, may elect at their pleasure 25 barons from the realm, 
who ought with all their strength to observe, maintain, and cause to be observed the peace and privileges which we have granted to them and confirmed by this our present charter. In such wise, namely, that if we, our justice, or our bailiffs, or any one of our servants shall have transgressed against any one in any respect, or shall have broken some one of the articles of peace or security, and our transgression shall have been shown to four barons of the aforesaid twenty-five, those four barons shall come to us, meaning the king, or if we are abroad, to our justice, meaning their judges, okay, showing to us our error, and they shall ask us to cause that error to be amended without delay. And if we do not amend that error, or we being abroad, if our justice do not amend it within a term of 40 days from the time it was shown to us, or we being abroad to our justice, the aforesaid four barons shall refer the matter to the remainder of the 25 barons, and those 25 barons with the whole land in common shall distrain and oppress us in every way in their power, namely by taking our castles, lands, and possessions, and in every other way that they can, until amends shall have been made according to their judgment. Got that? All right. Yeah. That's a long reading there, and I still didn't get through the whole paragraph. But what they're saying is, if you've got a problem with the king, in other words, the government, you can go to four of the members of the grand jury. Any four. Those four evaluated, and in their judgment, they go to the king if they so decide and tell the king, hey, we got a problem here, it needs fixing. And the king has 40 days to fix it. Or if the king isn't in town, then he can go to the judges. You got 40 days to fix the problem, a month and 10 days, okay? And if he doesn't fix it in that time, those four can go to the whole body of grand jury. Now it's got to be 25. You see why there's not 25 in our present day grand juries? Because we're still common law and 25 is a real grand jury. Okay, those, you go to, the four go to those 25. Those 25 are authorized to do anything they deem proper until the problem gets fixed. And later on it says they can do anything except they cannot put the king in jail and they cannot put his family in jail. But they can take all his property away from him. And not only that, later on it says in there that the king pre-authorizes anyone to assist the grand jury if the grand jury wants it. That assistance, okay? Now, <clears throat> that's common law. Now, the grand juries we have today, sure, they're called grand juries, but those are statutory grand juries. So, I remember in Orange County one year, the grand jury criticized the data processing department, the computer department of Orange County. And I remember the, the uh, supervisor of the county saying, well, that's the grand jury's opinion, you know, but they really don't know what's going on and how this is supposed to work. I don't think he could have said that to a real grand jury. Now I'll tell you an interesting provision in California statutes. You're gonna love this one. Any grand jury can remove any elected officer from office. It just takes the 25 or 21. Even the, the, the statutory grand jury can do it. But you see, how did this grand jury come about? Now somebody commented a little while ago, well, they have their own people planted in the grand jury. Well, that's true. The interview, basically, when you apply for grand jury service, I've looked at the, the process, and you go through a set of interviews, they actually visit you at your home, and eventually they decide who's going to be in the grand jury pool. And then once they've pre-selected these grand jurors, they then draw randomly out and get 25, or I mean 21 in Orange County, okay? So that's how they select them. So basically, they, and it's the judges that do the initial selection. So you can see it's pretty biased. But you look at the procedure here. If we're talking common law, how does a grand jury form? 
Well, they elect from among themselves. There is no predefined procedure for how the election is run. They choose their own. Now think what it would be like if I could get around up 25 of you guys, educate yourself in this whole process, form as a grand jury. And remember, a grand jury can be secret because this comes back from the old days when grand juries were in opposition to the king and they didn't want to be identified who they were. Okay, so you don't have to say who's on your grand jury, but I have a suggestion on how it should work. Since it's a concept that has not been exercised anywhere in the United States and probably in the past hundred years, what I think we should do is assemble 25, make it a grand jury, establish yourself officially, go down to the court administrator. He's the guy who schedules the courtrooms. Okay, and he has other responsibilities. Sometimes in some jurisdictions he's also the clerk of the court. But you go to the court administrator and you ask him to assign a room where you can meet as a grand juror. Because what will that do? That will give you credibility. If you're actually meeting in the court building, so to rebuild the strength of the grand jury, I think we should do that. Okay? How about asking for 25 right here? I think you can probably get it yeah. here. Well, but you need to have, you need to have, select among yourselves, a grand jury, you know, who you're going to put on. You want whoever you trust. Okay? You want to pick your best people because this is going to be a real delicate area. And then I would suggest that the very first case you ever take on, and you produce what's called a presentment, that's, that's, that's like an indictment, but it originates from within the jury instead of the DA presenting it to you, okay? You make up a presentment, but the very first case that you should take on should be one of those gut cases that you know in your heart what the right answer is to begin with, and the public will know. You pick a case like that where there's no question about what it's all about. And it's obvious that they deserve to be prosecuted. And it's difficult, and you make your press releases. We, the grand jury, have uh, make a present because this guy did something really, really bad. And you limit it to that. Once you get your strength in, then you can get to the cases that require more discretion, like income tax and so on, you know. Well, have you talked to Ron Branson, you know, the I, I have not talked to him, but he and I have communicated, and he knows everything. Yeah, I know, that's a problem. I'm, yeah. I, 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 he, 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 yeah. I offered to explain it. I offered to meet him. He's in the L.A. area. I offered to meet him. He turns it down. He, he simply tells me I'm wrong. And he's lost total faith in the system. He doesn't, he, he's bound up in his emotions. That's the way I perceive him. Yeah, so, you know, he's got a cause, but I keep telling him, I've looked at his, uh, his jail for judges proposal, and I, if I were a judge, I'd love it, because there's so many holes in it, you know, and uh, he's not going to get anywhere with that. I mean, it's a way of, you know, somebody throws a punch at you, if you can absorb it with a pillow, he still thinks he's punching you, but... You know, and, and to me, that jail for judges proposal is like a pillow. And the, the judges, well, I wouldn't object to it. Hey. So, do you live here in L.A. County or Orange County? Orange. Okay. So, but you can still help us organize a uh, grand jury here in L.A. County. Well, anybody can tell anybody anything. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you got a question. If I have an answer, I'll give it to you. You said we should do this. Uh, so you help well, it's my suggestion, organize, yeah. Could you help us organize a grand jury here in the county? Well, sure. You know, but look, look, there's no magic here. Read, read Article 61 of Magna Carta. It's all right there. Mm -hmm. It's also Article 52. There's some more information. But 61 is the key one. Have it's, you organized one in Orange We haven't done it yet. Okay. I talk to people about it, but nobody moves on it. You have to have 25 people who are committed. Well, that's one. <laughs> so you know, get the district attorney down there that's uh, a Look, fraud and making all kinds of waves. Well, if you have the evidence then, and you've got good, hard, solid evidence, then produce the, the presentment. But don't just willy-nilly. I mean, organize yourself and, and take the proper steps. 
don't let them know that's why you're going to meet. Your grand jury, you're forming, your proceedings are secret, and you want a room to meet. And now that's going to be your first battle, and he's going to say no. And now you're going to have to sue him so that he gives you what he should. Because your grand jury, you can order them. <laughs> okay? That's exciting. Ultimately. Thanks. Mm hmm Yeah. Now you're not going to testify, no. testify, right? You got a question? No, no, okay. I just want to ask you something. Uh -huh. I knew somebody a long time. He passed away. His name was Steve Cannon. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. Do you recall that story? Yeah. He had his own common law court. Yeah, yeah. He, 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 yeah. But his approach was is that you couldn't be sovereign unless you got certification from the community. That's not true sovereignty. Well, and 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 when we had a case for him to handle, he bailed out. Well, I was in court. He was supposedly uh, going down there. Uh, to back up a, a friend who had gotten a ticket. Yes, that's, I think I know that case. That's the one he bailed out on. And the judge, uh, he mentioned something in the court. Mm -hmm. He was a judge. Mm -hmm. And after that, his home was raided. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna set yourself up with a like a lightning rod, you're gonna be hit by lightning, <laughs> All right? Well, he, but he got hit by lightning. Yeah, but you know, the, I, I, I acknowledge that he did you know some good work and he had some good ideas. But the minute I, when I inquired of him, he specifically in his literature said that you could you had to get the certification from the community. You could not have sovereignty unless it was recognized by the community you were in. And that's not sovereignty. <clears throat> You're a sovereign because you say you are. Yeah, you, you don't need permission to be your own king. Yes, sir. Okay, I guess, is that it? We run out of tape? Thank you. Very okay, much. you're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Stephen, and thank you on behalf of Wendy and myself for attending the forum tonight. It was a long and exciting evening. Remember, 385-4003, call that recorded message and find up upcoming events. One more time, let's have a round of applause for Bill Thornton. And as in closing, as I always close, for those of you that have the eyes to see and the ears, for those of you that have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, may this knowledge take you on an, an enlightened path. And may you have a blessed ride and, and safe trip home tonight. Thank you for attending the Granada Forum. Thank you. Good night.